Hello, and welcome to Arts and Entertainment. With Chris and Randall. I'm Chris. I'm Randall. And welcome to our show. If you are new to the show, or you are not new to the show, and you haven't taken care of this yet, please like, subscribe, comment, listen, watch, share with your friends. And uh, again, as I said, if you want to comment and you think, hey, we're doing an awesome, amazing job, or you guys suck, or you know it'd be a really good episode for a future show. Hey, Randall, what's the best way to contact us? Um, probably our Facebook page. That's how everybody likes to contact us now, but you can email us. Uh, check out our website, uh, chrisandrandall.com, for different ways to contact us. And if you see us on Facebook and you leave a comment on Facebook, we're pretty good at catching those. Oh, yeah, we'll see it. We'll see it. We'll say it, and uh, we're on YouTube, and uh, yeah, just, it's so weird. I keep on forgetting that for some of you, you're not watching us, you're listening to us. Uh, If you are listening (laughs) to us, uh, Randall is the handsome one, and I'm the one with the good personality. Uh, Hey, Randall, a few weeks back, uh, you came up with a really good idea for an episode, and I really liked it, and we were talking basically about how there was almost a class difference in aesthetic taste these days. And Mm -hmm. that was a great episode. I thought it was, and it really talked about kind of the divide between what you you could call high art and low art or mass appeal and critical appeal. And it, it got me to thinking that we, we only really scratched one half of that surface. Well, I'm mixing metaphors. Uh, (laughs) Because, you know, that was just dealing with it on a socioeconomic issue. And I, and I thought to myself, uh, especially because the name of our show is called Arts and Entertainment. And even I and you are, are drawing uh, a keen distinction between art and entertainment. So I want to talk today about uh, the relationship in modern American society between what I would call critically acclaimed art and commercially successful art uh let's just define terms for people who don't know what the hell we're talking about but i think it's pretty simple uh a critically acclaimed work of art is the kind of art that critics acclaim and a commercially successful work of art is the kind that makes a lot of money that seem like a, a pretty clear uh definition? yeah i mean uh it seems like especially with movies but almost in all forms of art, there's uh, even even at the outset of creation of of pieces of works, uh, people have in mind if they're going to make a work for a mass audience to make money, <laughs> or they're going to make a work to uh, appeal to critics. Uh, certainly, certainly so. Or sometimes it it doesn't even matter what the intention of the artist is, as much as who reacts to it strongly. I mean, certainly sometimes the artist might just be making art for art's sake and they just happen to either command a lot of money and have a large enough following that when they make art for art's sake, they can get commercial success. And sometimes somebody who is just making their own thing for themselves. And, in, and I guess in some ways you're, you're actually darn. I want to get into this in a bit, but you raise such a great point, which is there is the critically acclaimed artist and there's a commercially acclaimed artist and there there's their intention. And then there's their audience, which is not so much within their control. And then there's the great arbiter of what is what. And, and certainly, you know, you can't have critically acclaimed art without a critic. So exactly what is what do we mean by a critic? Randall, what is the role of the critic? Well, we just talk about what a critic is. I mean, they 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 are usually reviewing, quote unquote, reviewing works, right? <laughs> they do movie reviews. Uh, Siskel and Ebert uh, were famous movie critics. Uh, uh, they usually write about works of art in 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 news media, and they. Uh, they pass judgments, right? I mean, you were telling me this was your idea earlier. Where you're telling me art critics, their their role essentially is to pass a judgment on works well, of art, right? I would definitely say that you know, and and I need to be a little clear. There's the critic, 
that you see in your like newspaper and then there's criticism which is an entire field and journals and magazines and publications uh so to be really clear uh i'm going to focus more on critic as in reviewer and not criticism as in the theoretician dealing with an overall idea so uh the critic is someone whose job it is to define the qualities of a work i'm just talking about the critics um in the most literal sense whose job is it is to pass judgment on new works or, or works of art at least as they debut into the wide spectrum and uh i feel that almost everybody i've ever met who is a critic has basically come out of Goethe's three questions which is you know this is the basic most basic understanding of the training of a critic which is uh what is the artist trying to do how well did he do it or she do it and was it worth doing and a critic should be trained in the aesthetic rules of a work of art so they can at least say how well this work approximates what we've agreed upon as being uh the way that art should be done or how well does it break the rules and what does it find so the critic in some senses is like a detective an investigator a judge but what they're doing is they're bringing their understanding of the art form to that particular work of art and then they're gauging it qualitatively to other works of art uh you could argue that the critic does the thinking for you as an audience member or when you go to see critically acclaimed work you're going because you are your favorite critic liked it or you want to see if the overall critical consensus is right um a great example of this is uh the movie parasite did you see the movie parasite yes i saw it to like it oh yeah it was a good movie all right uh i liked it too but i know that some people who saw it probably were not familiar with any what is the name of that film filmmaker again who that made parasite who, yeah i'll look it up okay well anyway you and i have both seen a number of films by this korean filmmaker he's been around for a number of years but bong uh, joon ho bong joon ho but unlike you know the bong joon homes uh, memories of murder which i saw in a little theater in the east village with six other people which is good cuz the theater only held 12 uh parasite was playing at the local amc with you know 50 people in the room so uh, a, sometimes a critic can really uh help spread the good word you know they become a platform they become an influencer whereas i feel you know if you look at the commercial art is is just decided by the market right yeah well i mean uh in some sense commercial art it's uh it's a tautology right i mean i mean commercial art is just there to uh to make money and if it makes money it's commercial art right well but yeah and commercial art is also I mean it's funny on one hand I could just say that something that is commercially is successful is ob- objectively successful right I mean here's a a nasty thing you can say and I'm not saying it's always true but like ah the only reason why this movie is liked by the critics is because this movie appeals to critics like uh they used to say that the only reason why Elvis Costello got positive reviews by music critics is because uh he wore glasses and he was skinny and he looked like a music critic. <laughs> I never heard that before. That's funny. Yeah, they used to say that music critics hated Van Halen because Van Halen looked like the kind of people who would beat up them when they were in high school <laughs> and they loved Elvis Costello because they could identify. And and in fairness, I would definitely say that um sure, you can absolutely look in in literature and in film and theater, you will see a lot of bright uh Ivy League educated white men reviewing the works of bright Ivy League educated white men. So, yeah, I mean absolutely speaking, there the subjectivity of criticism isn't always good. And certainly, yeah, there's something to be said for the fact that uh a song is so popular everyone buys that album or a movie is so great that everybody buys it goes to the theater. But if we're honest, commercially successful works also operate from a larger platform 
So the deck is stacked. I mean, uh, as successful as uh, even Parasite was, you know, the amount of theaters it opened at or even at its height premiered at is so much, it's like a tenth of, say, Avengers Endgame, right? So, like, I don't know how many screens in America or in the world Avengers Endgame premiered in, but it was X many times more than anything else. So doesn't that also, in a way, its platform being so large, almost ensure that it has a good chance of being commercially successful? Well, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, uh, it's... uh... A lot of a lot of commercial work uh, um, makes money because the distri- distribution the distribu- distribution company controls the distribution channels, right? I mean, uh, they can yeah. release Avengers Endgame and in five thousand theaters in the United States or whatever it is, and Parasite. Maybe it's a I don't know who released Parasite, but it's it's going to be a smaller release. You know, they're not going to five hundred theaters, right? That would be pretty damn good, right? Um, if you're a smaller uh, distribution company, you can't, you don't really have access to all the screens that uh, that Disney has. Right? I mean, in fact, you're, let's pick on Avengers Endgame for a minute because also there is the ancillary markets, right? Disney Plus will be showing the Avengers Endgame series, right? Uh, Walmart, uh, Target will be having thousands, millions of copies of the DVD that you can purchase for right. Avengers Endgame. This Much is why, more so than Parasite. This is why the internet and streaming is so interesting from an artistic standpoint, aesthetic standpoint, because, yes, in the olden days... See, I remember a long time ago. Now, I think we're getting way off topic now, Chris, but I remember in the olden days, like, I used to read uh, uh, film criticism magazines, yeah. and the critics would always talk about movies they would see at film festivals, and the critics would... Maybe they would offhandedly say uh in the in the review oh well maybe this movie will get a distributor <laughs> it's pretty good well, but actually, and and, and, and well let me finish point. chris and, and it would never it would never get a distributor and i would never see it okay <laughs> and now you can see everything the audience can see everything and so you go to netflix they have all these obscure independent movies uh disney is gonna put their more obscure stuff on there uh you don't have to wait until uh the dvd for something is released i mean we're we're in an unusual time now i mean maybe maybe uh critics are becoming nearly obsolete i don't know but what do you think no i think you just actually raised the opposite point which is that if you are and i'll pick on film for a few moments uh it's the power of the festival right i mean if you don't if you don't, uh, in, in, the, in the world of independent filmmaking, if you don't get a good festival, and I, I've known friends who've done this, then you're not going to get picked up. So you live and die on the festival, whereas if you're Avengers Endgame, that's not the case. Look, Marvel Comics struggled for years to become a blockbuster, but there was never a need for them to enter a film festival. They just needed to have someone put in enough talented people behind the scenes, writers, directors, actors in front of the camera, and money to make a quality, commercially successful film based on, of course, commercially successful intellectual property. So, you know, and I'm I'm not picking on it. I love Avengers Endgame. Please do not think I'm slamming on Avengers Endgame, but it is based on work that was already commercially successful uh, comic books had a wide enough distribution outlet. Uh, and certainly there's movies that come out that bomb. I mean, certainly, you know, movies that in independent films that never get past the festivals, they're just never seen, so they're obscure. But films that get a lot of promotion, say like Lone Ranger that came out, what, two years ago with Johnny Depp and Armin Hammer? Mm-hmm. Like When they right. bomb, they bomb. So... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it's definitely it's definitely a different stage. One of the other things that I think I wanted to talk about as it relates to uh, com- critically acclaimed artwork as far as another outlet for it is academia. Uh, I have no idea how many copies of The Great Gatsby are purchased every year at Barnes & Noble <laughs> or whoever sells books on Amazon for the sheer joy of reading F. Scott Fitzgerald, I hope to God uh, it's a lot, but let's be blunt. 
the majority of people who read The Great Gatsby are reading The Great Gatsby because their high school teacher or their college professor has put it on the syllabus. Right. Well, in a certain sense, right, academia is there to help create the canon to decide which of our works of art are the greatest works of art of our civilization, decide which works of art maybe represent our civilization in a certain way. Um, this is why we've had such fraught conversations of late, right, about the canon, about uh, authors in the canon. It's uh, it's the discussion about who who you want to represent our civilization, right? And they want it, and certain people want it to be more inclusive. And yeah, and I would say, like, the, while the critic is the person who introduces the artwork to the world and the academics, they are the ones who enshrine it, right? I mean, in fact, I mean, I would argue the academics are far more important than even the critics because once it's enshrined, it's very difficult to remove. <laughs> well, long term, right? Yes, I think long you're term. right. I mean, because the stakes are raised, right? Like if the critics just love The Great Gatsby, I may or may not read The Great Gatsby. But if my English teacher is requiring me to read The Great Gatsby and my ability to understand and grasp it in a critical analytical manner dictates my academic success in the class, now it's not just I'm not just reading for my the sheer joy of reading. I'm reading literally for my own academic survival. Right. And, you know, I, I think that the interesting thing about attacks on works like The Great Gatsby, about uh, works that were enshrined earlier in the canon, is that uh, the attacks are upon the identity of the author rather than anything intrinsic to the work, right? <laughs> I yeah. Mean, it's a, he's a dead white male, therefore we shouldn't read it, right? I mean, well, is there something wrong with The Great Gatsby? No one says anything, right? I mean, Well, actually, so, if, if anything, I would argue The Great Gatsby with every year becomes a more woker book as if it, <laughs> it deals with issues of class and sexism and violence. I mean, there, it, it's more topical today than it was at any other time in history. You know, you can teach Great Gatsby with queer theory. You can teach... It with a leftist Marxist analysis. I mean, there are so many ways that you can bring modern structural theory to Gatsby, which might mean Gatsby is going to stay enshrined long after we're dead. Well, it's because there there's a lot of meat to chew on in Gatsby, and uh, uh, in a lot of ways, Fitzgerald is really exploring the American experience with Gatsby, right? I mean, and and and, and it's uh, it's relevant even today. Maybe even then more relevant. There's a downside too, though, which is that if your first exposure to the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald is a great Gatsby in a high school English class where if you don't understand it, you're not going to get a good grade, once you're out of school, once you're out of your college, wherever, once your education ends, how likely is the average person going to want to read another work of Fitzgerald? Much less as an adult, reread Great Gatsby just for the sheer joy of reading it. Well, do you think that's important? I mean, I... I think it, but I think it unfortunately causes a backlash. I think, in fairness, because uh, a lot of critically acclaimed art is, I hate to use this word, is foisted. <laughs> is foisted upon you at a young age when you can least appreciate it but you're being told you have no choice but to read this and to find what makes it great, given your own limited life experience, by the way. Yes, uh, I will say I will say that I was forced to read Gatsby in high school, and it was way over my head. I mean, yeah. now that I look at it again as an adult in my mid forties, I mean, I see it as a, uh, I see it as the spectacular work it is. But I, I, I really have a hard time understanding why high school kids are forced to read it. I mean, it's, I think it's way over the head of most high school kids. I mean, well, and that's a, a really good thing. And I talk sometimes to my mom about this because for a long time she was a, uh, an elementary school teacher, and uh, I think that one of the problems, one of the, I've always felt one of the great problems. In, in school is that they think that critically acclaimed work can just be appreciated by everyone 
as long as you explain to everybody what's going on, which is not, by the way, what a critic does. I want to be very clear. A critic draws distinctions and finds things and drosses them. But, you know, when you're reading critically acclaimed work in high school, and by the way, I'm going to talk about the difference right now between critically acclaimed work in high school versus critically acclaimed work in college versus critically acclaimed work in grad school. So in high school, uh, it would be very easy to have a syllabus about the Great Depression and the 1920s and the Roaring Twenties, and you're just literally teaching Gatsby as a very simplistic understanding of, uh, of the jazz age, right? We're just gonna understand how life was like and how difficult it was to be rich and how difficult it was to be poor. And then you get to college and in college, in your introductory English class, you're, you're talking about the American dream, right? That's what college professors love. Like, you know, <laughs> is this an indictment of the American dream? What does Fitzgerald mean by there are no second acts in America? And, and what does it mean to, uh, to uh, be a self-created person, right? And then you get into graduate school. And obviously, you know, if you're in graduate school for English, you know, you're, you're gonna look at Fitzgerald and his Catholicism and the socioeconomic psychosexual dyna dynamic <laughs> that are going on in the book. And if you're in a writing program, you might look at his use of the color green as a reapurging metaphor that gives <laughs> context and beauty to both nature and cash. But you know, the more and more you deconstruct the book to fit uh, your critical analysis, I would argue, uh, and I hate to say it, I think the more you get away from the beauty of the book. And I almost also feel like in fairness, uh, Sometimes I feel like a critic can actually pervert the understanding of a great work of art because it, it makes you too, you're not looking at the work as the work, you're looking at it as all these things that have been forced upon your head that you need to know in order to appreciate the work. You know, I think you're right. Uh, there's a story, you can Google it, Harlan Ellison's uh, Dune adaptation, or Harlan Ellison, uh, David Lynch's Dune adaptation. Harlan Ellison tells a story about it. He says that... Uh, they didn't let critics see an advanced version of the movie, right? <laughs> and that pissed all the critics off. And yeah. they didn't let them see an advanced version. I forget. It was some silly reason. Like the – I forget now. Like the it wasn't ready. The print wasn't ready or something. Anyway, yeah. so when the critics finally see it, they were all, they already had their knives out, and they were ready to tear it apart. And so Lynch's Dune, I thought it was great. I mean, I think it's like one of the all-time greatest sci-fi movies. But, you know – um, when it comes out, it got horrible reviews. Critics were just like all over it for being a horrible movie. And uh, Allison writes this great essay about how it was just the studio just pissed all the critics off and they just wanted to retaliate. And, and, and that, that, those early critical reviews of, of that movie uh, destroyed the movie. Like anybody today, like me, <laughs> who might say it's a good movie, is not going to be taken seriously. Ever. Uh, then you raise a really good point. I mean, even Gatsby, there's been three versions of Gatsby, and they have all gotten terrible reviews. And there is a saying, uh, and I don't remember where I first heard it, but I definitely heard it as, at least as early as the 1990s, that if you want to never uh, – great books never make terrible movies, but terrible books make great movies. <laughs> and all you have to do is look at something like Mario Puzo's uh, the Godfather, which is a very mediocre book, go try reading it, or uh, Peter Not Benchley's Jaws, which is yeah. completely different, you know, but Jaws, The Godfather, these are great movies, uh, you know, and... Uh, well, Gone with the Wind probably fits Gone in Gone with the Wind is another one of these. I mean, Gone with the Wind, the book isn't a horrible book, but it's not like, no one considers it classic literature, I don't think. No, but they're not, and in fact, that's the thing. So critically acclaimed... And I know we're really leaning into books. I promise we'll get past books in a minute, but books right now are really, it's just the, it's the thing that all of us kind of really are gonna come into contact with. And books really, books and film really is, is just the easiest distinction to draw into. But, you know, that's the thing is that, uh, it's, it, it is really interesting how the formats, it's almost as if, I mean, there probably have been one or two productions of books or great plays into film. But it's almost as if what makes a film a great film requires that none of its source material be critically acclaimed. 
Yeah, and you almost that. have to just like the, 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 the somehow what makes a great work of art in another medium just doesn't often travel well, one, to the other. Well, we're getting a little bit off topic, but I think one of the problems with uh, adapting uh, something that's considered a classic, spectacular work uh, is that your adaptation will never live up to the original. Yeah. But if you adapt, if you adapt something that's just mediocre, <laughs> you can improve <laughs> upon it, and then everybody will love it. And, and, I, and it's another good point, too, because of critically acclaimed work of art getting translated into a commercially acclaimed wor work of art is almost an anathema, you know, because what because some, I, if you really think about it, and we should have gotten to this way earlier in the discussion, but I believe, <laughs> really should have talked about this right from the top, but I believe that uh, the, the difference between a commercially acclaimed work of art and a critically acclaimed work of art as an audience member, not as a critic, not as a box office, but as you, the spectator, is that uh, you have to bring uh, a lot more, you have to be a much more active participant when looking at critically acclaimed art. You have to either bring uh, an analytical skill uh, you really do. You have to bring an analytical skill. You have to be able to do a little of the work of understanding context, deciphering code, whatever it is. Look, understanding a symbol, understanding what's going, the dynamic subtextually. You know, you 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 can't just kind of sleepwalk through it. You really need to bring something to the work. Whereas commercially. Uh, successful art, I would argue, really appeals to us on an intuitive level. And you almost, I'm not going to say you don't have to think, but any more than I don't think in critically acclaimed art, you don't have to feel. But I do feel that a lot of the heavy lifting is done for you in commercially successful art. And I think one of the reasons why we're hitting this problem pretty quickly on is things like Dune, which is a great example you really have to bring a lot of understanding to Dune, the book, the novels, in order to appreciate it. So when you all of a sudden, I just saw the trailer, by the way, for the latest version. It looks awesome. Uh, so who knows? I can't wait. Maybe, Dune uh, maybe, is one of my all-time favorites. Maybe they'll finally get it right. Uh, who knows? So when, egg on my face then. But it, it, it is it's much harder on a filmmaker to find a way of conveying the heavy lifting of a reader to the easy understanding of a film goer. And uh, we'll probably go into this a bit more, but I mean, that's a good thing to right now just say. I mean, I think that let's look at two filmmakers who I really feel operate in two almost, they're both successful. One is critically successful. One is commercially successful. And I honestly feel that they both really illustrate this point very well. James Cameron and Wes Anderson. Uh, uh, let's see, Randall, what, uh, what's your favorite James Cameron film? Uh, didn't I already answer this question? I can't remember what I said. <laughs> you did it during the actual interview. This is a pre-interview. Yes, we, we talked before the show, so I think, we don't just ramble. I think I just want to say Titanic. Was, right now, I'm just going to say it's Titanic. It's probably Titanic, the best Titanic, and I would say for me, uh, I like Titanic, but I'm always going to love Aliens. Oh, aliens! Uh, That's the one I said before, but now I'm now yeah. I'm the Titanic. Titanic, <laughs> aliens, uh, Terminator One, which is actually you know a low budget film. By the way, Terminator. Harlan Ellison again. Harlan Ellison sued James Cameron because because he claimed James Cameron oh, yeah. stole his idea from yeah. a short story for Terminator, and he won. Yeah. I just want to say that. Okay, and I even like True Lies, which I know is not. It, True Lies is a terrible film. I mean, it's just a god awful film, and I like it. Uh, I've never seen The Abyss. Have you seen The Abyss? Yes, I've seen The Abyss. You never seen The Abyss? No. Was that good or bad? You know, it's funny because it's like I think it's James Cameron's most artistic movie, even though he spent a lot of money making it. But it's his most like uh, it's his least commercially minded movie, I would say. I would say, and I know that it introduced uh, this particular form of CGI that he's famous for. In the abyss that you get to see in Terminator 2 and that you get to see throughout the 1990s and early aughts, just like uh, he is incredibly innovative for 3D animation for Avatar, Avatar groundbreaking. So 
you know, James Cameron is a groundbreaking filmmaker, visually speaking. He uses state-of-the-art technology. He pushes the edge of technology. His films are some of the highest grossing films of all time. If you're listening to this, there's a very good chance at least one of his films is a movie that you would, if I said, look, uh, there's a big screen, uh, Dolby uh, surround sound, IMAX, everything you like, uh, and you can sit there by yourself, uh, would, you, would you like to see a James Cameron film? You probably go, yes. I mean, he is, he is probably one of the most successful, truly one of the best, I would argue, commercial successes because of the risks he takes, the amount of money he puts in. Uh, I'm not saying as a critical success. In fact, I would argue, I think he's rarely ever gotten any positive criticism, has he? He doesn't get much positive criticism. Well, you know, a lot of his uh, movies, they tend to be retreads. I mean, Aliens is a sequel. Titanic is basically the remake of the old Titanic movie. I, I think it has the same storyline even. Uh, Avatar is like, steals its storyline from Fern Gully. I think people <laughs> people like to say, um, but you know he's not. James Cameron isn't interested in making uh, novel art. He's not interested in pleasing the critics. He's not interested in making um, art that's uh, innovative in a certain uh, in like a I mean, ideological films... way. He's interested in making art that's uh, innovative aesthetically. You know, right, aesthetically and, uh, and entertaining. He is highly entertaining. He's similar to Lucas in that respect, because yeah. Lucas was very obsessed with with the visuals of both THX 1138 and Star Wars uh, when he's working on those movies. Uh, so hold that thought, because I want to get to Wes Anderson for a sec. So Wes Anderson, uh, what's your favorite at Wes Anderson? Well, Wes Anderson is like the opposite. Uh, right. Um, Rushmore. Right. We both agree. Rushmore is the best. Mu one, right? Mushroar. <laughs> uh uh, Royal Tannenbaums, uh, Moonrise Kingdom. Uh, I liked Isle of Dogs. Uh, yeah, Isle of Dogs is a great movie. You know, see, Wes Anderson is like the opposite of James Cameron, right? So James right. Cameron is... Low budget, low budget. Well, right? it, it, James Cameron is obsessed with the way things look, the aesthetics of it, uh, and Wes Anderson's more obsessed with characters and storyline and acting. Oh. Yeah, but you you were saying this earlier before the show. You're right. Visually speaking, Grand Budapest Hotel is spectacular. Yeah, I love the way Grand Budapest Hotel looks. I mean, he did a great job on that. The stop motion work on Fox and his friends, Mr. F the fabulous Mr. Fox and the Isle of Dogs is beautiful, but lo-fi, right? Wes Anderson's whole visual aesthetic is... Well the striking is, is, thing is, is on the parallel it's the parallel opposite of James Cameron right <laughs> well the strike yes but the striking thing about Wes Anderson movies is just how novel and original the storyline and characters are right i mean they yeah. they are Wes Anderson's trying to come up with something novel he's trying to push the uh, artistic envelope in that respect i mean Cameron is 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 uh content to just uh recycle a proven plot recycle proven uh, stereotype-typed characters and just build on top of that. And I will say this much, as financially successful as Cameron has been is as critically successful as Wes Anderson has been. I mean, both of these people, weirdly enough, Cameron's the one who won the Academy Award and not Wes Anderson. But I think <laughs> it's only a matter of time for Wes Anderson. I really believe that, in fact, him not winning the Academy Award but saying the L.A. film critics just proves that there is no – like, Wes Anderson is truly a critical – he's the critic's choice. You know what I'm saying? He is so not mainstream in that, you know, the amount of theaters his films are released in. Uh, I don't think he's ever going to make a 3D IMAX film. Uh, Maybe. You're right. visually, visually speaking, too, like, while I would argue – the films of his look great. There are no good action sequences in a Wes Anderson <laughs> film. Even when he's trying in Isle of Dogs, I don't really think he pulls it off. Well, he's not interested in that, right? Well, uh, actually, his best work as that was in Rushmore, where uh, the titular character, the not the titular cat, the kid in it, uh, who's the star, he takes famous Hollywood blockbusters and he recreates them in a high school setting. 
so that he takes like Apocalypse Now and he makes like the lowest budget version of Apocalypse Now. And it's yeah, you, hysterical because it's so cheap looking. Right. Well, you know, Spike Jones did that a lot. in um, what was it? Uh, Be Kind Rewind, was it? Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it came after uh, Rushmore. But yeah, that's my point. So he even he's willing to even make fun of the fact that he doesn't have that. Now, I just want to be really clear. I I enjoy a good James Cameron film. And I enjoy a good Wes Anderson film, and I, I've been bored by both men equally uh, in their lesser works. Um, I'm not saying one is better or worse than the other. I'm just saying that uh, – well, then what the frick am I saying? I'm just saying they're, they're – <laughs> like, Randall, what am I saying here about these two men? I think you are getting to a point – where you're you're seeing it my way that there's not much of a difference between the critical critically acclaimed work and the non critically acclaimed oh, work. I'm just saying work. that there. I you're would say that there, none is not worse or better. They're just completely different. Another example of this is uh, let's look at the novels, though they have both been made into movies. Let's ignore that. Let's look into the novel of Stephen King's The Shining, right, which is about a man who is a frustrated writer who takes his family to this Overlook Hotel where he becomes the caretaker. He gets possessed by evil spirits and eventually goes on a killing rampage where he dies. Uh, and Metamorphosis, right, about a man named Greg Samsa who wakes up one day and he's an insect. Uh, both of these books, I mean, if you've read uh, Stephen King's uh, memoir on writing, both of these books are metaphors, right? Mm -hmm. They're horrors. They're phantasmagorias, uh, they're metaphors on, on a state of being, and yet The Shining is certainly one of the most popular horror novels, and uh, Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis, again, not only is it critically acclaimed, but good luck getting through high school and college without somehow finding that on your reading list. <laughs> it's pretty gross. I mean, you, read it, you, you were forced to read that in school? Uh, several times. I, I, by the way, I love both, don't get me wrong. But their approach is completely different. Well, how would you – how, how so? Well, I, I mean I, I, I think that it's very fair to say that Kafka is, is writing social criticism or social satire. He is taking a, a, the concept of a man transformed into an insect to, to basically explore a psychological state and feeling of insignificance. And he's leading with that. Whereas I feel like the metaphor, because uh, we have to remember King is an al is, has issues with drugs and alcohol, really probably should have picked Misery because he felt Misery was more about that. But he's also, his, by making his protagonist a writer in The Shining, he is clearly also writing about himself and his own personal demons and his own edification. And he writes about a writer in uh, Misery, The Dark Half, and a lot of King's work. It's pretty clear King is writing a character that is some element of himself. But I feel that King's first goal is to scare the shit out of you. <laughs> I think that's the real key difference. I mean, and I want to really be clear about this. It's pretty easy to talk about the work of art being commercially successful because the box offices or the readers have bought the book. And it's very easy to talk about critics. But let's get now into the artist's intent. And I don't think any writer can honestly say, I'm going to write a book and it's going to be a bestseller. I don't, I've read his memoir. When he was writing The Shining, he was yet to become the famous Stephen King. He was just a very successful Stephen King. So he certainly could not have known that when he wrote The Shining 45 years ago, that it would be a bestseller made into three different movies. I believe they're remaking it again. Plus there's a spin-off movie and a novel. He had no idea that it would be successful. He just wanted to write the scariest book he could write based on his love of scary novels. And when Kafka is writing, uh, I don't think Kafka is writing for the critics. Kafka is simply writing to explore his own feelings and to share the world 
his view of society and to criticize well, society. Right. Kafka famously uh, wants all his works, a lot of his works destroyed when he's when he dies. Right. And yeah, uh, I don't know if the Metamorphosis was published during his life. I mean, I can't remember now. But I honestly don't remember either. It could be and one of the was. works that uh, that survived his death accidentally. <laughs> his friends, his friends didn't want to destroy it. Um, so yeah, so Kafka is very much a personal writer. But yeah, King is always he's always writing for us, the audience, isn't he? Right. I and mean, in that sense, I, maybe it's the deal. Maybe that is one of the things that really differentiates the uh, the writer of popular work versus critical work is that more often than not the writer of and i don't mean just a writer i'm so sorry the artist it could be a painter musician a poet it doesn't matter but the creative person behind critically acclaimed art first and foremost is probably creating art that speaks to themselves and they want to share with the world how they with the audience uh how they see the world they're yeah, sharing I, their viewpoint. Yeah, I think you're right. I don't I mean, think that's the case about commercial art. I think the point of commercial art is to, uh, and I'm not saying that they're without a viewpoint. That's absurd. But they're, they want to be understood and they want you to get where they're coming from and they don't want to lose you along the way. Right. Well, well, there's, there's the type of artist that wants to uh, have an audience. They want to have the largest audience possible. They want to enter entertain people. They want to make entertainment. And there's a type of artist who doesn't really care about any of that stuff. Uh, well, let me ask you a personal question. So when you were at USC, uh, you took creative writing with a very famous, critically acclaimed novelist, T. Congression Boyle. Uh, what was it like learning the role of the novelist, the approach to writing from uh, a critically acclaimed artist? <laughs> well, the main thing that I really remember from his classes, just how interested he was in his students. He, he read everything that we wrote, you know, he, we, he had us write, uh, uh, comments and criticisms of our, of our, uh, classmates works and the writing workshops. And he read them all <laughs> and he had, and if he found a criticism he liked on somebody's work, he read it out loud in class. Um, I remember I uh, wrote a very harsh criticism of one of my friends uh, or friends, one of my classmates uh, stories, and uh, he he picked it and read it out loud in class. I felt so bad that he read it out loud. <laughs> I was like, so it was hard. It was like the worst criticism. I hated this this story. It was like the worst criticism I ever wrote. Um, but yeah, he liked it for some reason. Uh, he was funny, too. He had all sorts of jokes he would put in there. Like, I remember he. Independence Day, you know, the original Independence Day movie had just come out. Yeah. And so uh, he had this joke he he did a couple times where we would read a short story that was uh, that was about, uh, you know, that was very intimate and touching and, and emotional. And then he'd say, hey, does this story need something like uh, like a flying saucer to come and blow up the house they're living in? Because <laughs> that's what happens in Independence Day, right? It's like this. This so, flying saucer gets the blows at the White House. Did he have any kind of advice on the on the craft of, of writing that he would share with you guys? You know, so Boyle is is definitely not the kind of writer that is trying to write a bestseller, okay? <laughs> like if, if any of his books sold, it's by accident. I mean, <laughs> he was most interested in helping us find our own voice and seeing what we wanted to express. Um, yeah, so he's, he's probably like the opposite kind of writer of Stephen King, you know, I, you know, you could tell, I think you could tell reading like uh, Stephen King, you could tell the guy's trying to sell some books, you know, um, it, it does, I, I am kind of, sometimes when you take an author like Stephen King or an artist like Stephen King, you wonder like, uh, what if he did make a more intimate work that was, oh, that's a very good point, uh. That's a I would, really I would good be point. curious. And, you know, I know that King, he sold, he tried publishing some books under a pseudonym for a while. Yeah, a, a Richard Bachman. So if, if studying under a critically acclaimed novice, that's what it's like. Uh, I studied sitcom writing under a, a very smart sitcom writer, a woman named Paula Roth, who had started out as a, writing, as, as a writer on Laverne and Shirley, which is a very successful show. And she became the showrunner for Perfect Strangers, also a very successful sitcom. And uh, 
to be really clear, she was well read, she was cultured, she was smart. But when we sat down in her sitcom writing class and we would watch shows, talk about shows, look at scripts, and she would share her, her knowledge, uh, what we really almost always focused on was working within the confines of a commercial medium where there, you have a set act structure, you have a set scene structure, you have a limitation on language and content because at the time I took this class, you were not writing for cable, you were writing for the networks. Um, you had a, it was much less about uh, being innovative and more about, it was more about writing things that people recognized, but solving the issues or going about trying to solve the issues in a unique and interesting way. So everybody was familiar with the setup and everyone expected a conclusion because on a sitcom, everything goes back to normal. But what they're really trying to see is how inventive and creative you can be in that midpoint of the story. Where do you take the stories? And not just that, but it's not about how you can make new characters when you write a sitcom. It's how can you take these established characters from the show who in fairness are just archetypes of comedy in general, and how can you do new and creative things with them while still working within the confines of who these characters already are? So that you make a show that feels like it was already on the air, but a really good episode. And uh, you know, you don't learn in those classes, you don't stifle your creative voice, but you learn how to put your creative voice in the service of a commercial medium, which I think has to be the opposite of working on a novel. And yeah, I, I mean, if the, if the novel is, uh, unless the no unless you're trying to make a bestseller, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, th th there's very few art forms that are as intimate and as individual as, as novel writing. Um, the, uh, the 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 format any kind of uh, video format you know usually is so labor intensive that it precludes uh a lot of uh idiosyncratic or individual voices i mean james cameron's approach to movie making uh of course it's going to happen of course it's going to be the way to go of course people are going to be doing that you know i mean people like wes anderson are are going they're trying to make something uh something unusual and something more personal, I mean, it's going to be more of a struggle. Well, I will say that I think what distinguishes both of these men, and we haven't really said it, is that both of these men have a point of view. Both of them have a POV. Uh, and the only key really big difference is, is that Cameron's POV is to work within traditional commercial expectations and, and surprise you. And Anderson's POV is to abandon traditional expectations and just present what he finds entertaining and surprise you to the degree that you will come along with him on his idiosyncratic ride. Uh, and I think the best way of saying it is it's the difference between finding the complexity in the simple and taking complex things and, and making them simple enough for everyone to understand. Uh, and I think, you know, Let's go on to the the to money, right? Because both of these things are fueled by money, right? And mm -hmm. what is really the difference and and why between uh, the people who support commercially successful work versus the people who provide the money and the outlay for what will be critically acclaimed work? Well, you know, we got into this in our pre-discussion about how. A lot of things that are critically acclaimed, a lot of works that are critically acclaimed, uh, they're not going to make money. So people support them for the social presti for prestige, right? So that they are, uh, I don't know, for social status, right? It's like so. When... Like if you're a philanthropist, you're giving money to an art museum or to an artist or to uh, a grant for a writer to take time off and work on his novel or a ballet composer to comp choreograph her work. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so like a prestigious theater will have a wall of donors' names, right? You walk yeah. in the theater, there's a wall of donors' names up there, and what are they doing? They're doing that 
because the theater's never going to make money. <laughs> Because they're going to make of losing money at this theater. (laughs) They're going to make work that I don't know can't make money. I don't know. Yeah, this Uh, this this play was sponsored by a generous donation from Chris Corbell, who (laughs) will make no money off of this work of art, but just wants you to know he's a supporter of the arts. Right. Uh, I'm not even joking. Uh, My mom loves to tell this story because she was friends with Clyde Barnes, and Clyde Barnes and Joe Papp went to Peggy Guggenheim's house, and she's the one who's responsible for funding was it Peggy? it was one of the guggenheims i apologize very wealthy and there was when they were starting out the public theater and said we want to give you the opportunity to we think you're they, they presented it as somehow she was being considered for this exclusive opportunity to donate money to their cause <laughs> as if they were affording her she kicked them out uh so <laughs> that is really though what you're talking well about that's what she's getting she's getting prestige in return and critically acclaimed art is that if you're lucky we'll let you put your name on our thing you know we will let you name this theater hall after you but only if we really consider you to be worthy which right it's so- hysterical because if you ever go to some of these art museums you will see some of the most you guys would end up going to jail for financial scams, companies that would go out of business for financial scams. Uh, Klaus von Bülow, his name still exi- it can be is seen every time you walk inside the Museum of Metropolitan Art. You know, the man who put his wife in a coma. Uh, but I get, I'm getting a little too far afield. Whereas, you know, when you're funding what will be hopefully commercially successful, you're looking at your ROI. You're looking at your return on your investment. Well, Disney if- cannot exist unless they make money off of their incredibly expensive blockbusters. Most studios, certainly. Disney at least has amusement parks. But, you know, at least pre-COVID, right, it, you could even make an art film if you were a film company unless you had a couple of blockbusters under your belt. Right. So, well, so somebody like Wes Anderson, the – the studio that funds Wes Anderson. Now, Wes Anderson's movies might not um, uh, lose money. They might make a little bit of money. But when Wes Anderson goes on to get critical acclaim for the movie and wins awards, perhaps, uh, the people of the studio get to bask in that that prestige, right? And yeah. uh, they get to say, oh, we uh, we helped make this Wes Anderson movie. <laughs> And and they get social standing because of that. Uh, they can go to Hollywood dinner parties and say, "Yeah, I I was the executive producer of uh, this Wes Anderson movie." Yeah, and where it's in commercially successful art, uh, it's almost like starting your own business. There's a lot. Of, I once remember reading an interview with a commercial screenwriter where he said, "It's like writing an investment portfolio, a stock proposal for a company when you write a screenplay because." what you're writing is the blueprint for something that's going to be a high risk investment of a lot of money in the hope that they can make an even greater return on their investment. And if they fail to do so, they will lose their jobs possibly, you know, rarely can a film executive or even a film company afford to have that many losses. But not only do they lose money, but often they are by guilt, by association, film careers, for even actors, writers, directors are destroyed because of bombs. So the stakes are pretty damn high in yeah, trying just, to make a commercially successful film. I want to bring up another record. I want to bring up another example. A good example of what we're talking about is uh, Mir- the studio Miramax, founded by Harvey Weinstein. Like he, Harvey Weinstein was a master at uh, making Oscar bait movies and movies that the critics loved, but his movies were like losing money all over the place. So. Uh, some studio had to step in and buy Miramax so that it could continue to exist. And I think that was Disney, right? It was Disney. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so Disney to this day owns Miramax. And, uh, if I remember right, and, uh, they only bought it because of the prestige that it affords them. Right. Because well, Disney, you're, you're, here's you're Disney, really, yeah, yeah. A, a, a huge commercial conglomerate that, you know, makes the Marvel movies now makes the star Wars movies now. You know, but what is what eludes Disney is like the uh, the critical acclaim, right? The uh, the Oscar movies, right? And so they buy yeah. Miramax, it gives them that. And, and and while it's true that it's a lot of money that funds both the fine arts and the commercial arts, albeit with very different agendas, let's talk about the actual person who attends. Let's what is it that we expect? You know, when you buy a ticket to see you two, 
uh, at Madison Square Garden or at the Staples Center versus when you buy a ticket to go to an opera here <laughs> at uh, the Dorothy Chandler or the Metropolitan, the New, uh, Metropolitan Opera House in New York. You know, what is the agreement? What is it that you're doing, you know, and why are you doing it, right? It's completely different, right? If I'm spending $500 for really good seats at a U2 concert, I really know that, look, Bono's a wealthy man. He doesn't need my $500, but I'm going to get as much Bono as I can afford. Now, if I wanted to go to, say, the opera here in L.A. and go to the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and see L.A. Opera and get, I spend $500, true, I could certainly make that same claim that I'm trying to get as close to this great soprano or tenor as I can and hear them. But I can also say that they're not, that money I'm putting into that theater is also helping support the arts, right? It's a completely well, the, the, different the, kind of experience. Right. The patron, the audience goer, uh, going to a critically acclaimed work, they're trying to get the same kind of prestige that the, uh, the backers got, right? Uh, you're, you're going to the opera to, to, to get some prestige of going to the opera, right? Well, I mean, for... I'm not saying that you are only going for the prestige because that That's would one... make you very super. But it's certainly a side benefit. It's a side benefit, no doubt, from it, right? It's definitely a side right. benefit. Right. Well, you're not going to brag that you saw the latest Michael Bay movie, but you may brag <laughs> you saw the latest Wes Anderson movie, right? I mean, Right, but, but that's certainly true. But also there's an agreement that when you are going – when you're going to see Bono sing in front of your face, and I've seen him, he's a great live performer, go see him. Uh, you're expecting Bono to entertain the fuck out of you. You're expecting Bono to be 100% at it, and he does not disappoint. I will say, Bono, U2 in real life, is like watching U2 on a video or listening to their album, but only better. It's 100% satisfaction guaranteed. It's wonderful. Probably it's the same thing to see the Rolling Stones but he is working for your entertainment dollar. Whereas you will be a lot more forgiving when you go to the opera if you find that maybe the soprano is, is okay, but not great. The orchestra is, is fine, but you know it can be a little uneven. It doesn't need to be as, or it might even require you to pay a bit more attention, but you're still there. I've seen a pretty okay adaptation of the ring cycle that on some level aesthetically was a little too science fictional for my tastes. Um, and some of the singers were good, but not great. And it was just, I would give it a B, a B to B plus, depending on which version of which opera they were doing. But do I regret having spent literally an entire year attending these plays that make up the cycle? No, of course not. Because, uh, just the it's so rare to get to go to the ring cycle it's so rare to hear wagner's music it's so rare to see a very okay production of wagner that i will be much more forgiving of wagner of a of an adaptation of a production of the ring cycle because it's it's just harder to get and because it's harder to do right whereas pop music is not that hard to get and it's not that hard to do right. Now, I'm not saying you can't be a talented pop musician. I'm just saying that working within the forms of popular music is not as challenging as working in the forms of classical music. So I'm going to bring a little bit more of, an, of, of a responsibility to me. And I think the best example of this is let's compare the experience of going to Disneyland with the experience of going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Right? I mean, these are both, one is a, one of the greatest uh, commercial successes as an experience. The other one is a great critical success experience, right? See the great works of art or ride the great rides of amusement parks. You've you been know, to both, right? Well, the yes. The interesting thing about it is uh, you go to a great art museum or you go to a Disneyland, <laughs> a Disney park, uh, they're both filled with art, aren't they? And uh, so they're, they're a similar experience well, in but, certain but ways. Well, but it's different because the art in Disneyland is decorative. It's in service of the ride. It's in service of the theme. The art in a museum isn't really so much decorative. It's in service of the vision of the artist. So they're, they're really playing for two, like Wes Anderson 
and James Cameron, they're really, they have two separate agendas. Oh, yeah, but, maybe. I but mean... but where you're going, what's the agreement when you're going to Disneyland, right? It's, it, I'm not, I'm sorry to say this. I feel like when you're going on Pirates of the Caribbean, I love Pirates of the Caribbean. If you get a chance, go. It's a passive experience. You're sitting down. You're going through this pirate world with animatronics and designs that's three-dimensional. It's beautiful. It's lovely. It's very creative. But everything is being given to you to experience on a very visceral level. And it, it's doing all the heavy lifting for you. Do you like the Pirates of the Caribbean? Is that a ride you've been on that you enjoy? Yeah, I've always loved it since I was a kid, yes. Since you were a kid, right? It's the perfect one for a kid, right? Because it knows you better than it knows yourself, right? It knows how to scare you, right? I mean, when you see Davy Jones's ghost, right, coming at you, or when you see the, the cannon firing another ship. Well, it wasn't that scary when I was a kid. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But you know what I'm saying? It's It's enthralling on a very base and primordial level. Well, you know, I feel, I mean, see, I grew up in Southern California, uh, and I went to Disneyland a lot, and uh, part of the fun of Disneyland was always just the visual part of it, the the artworks. I mean, Pirates of the Caribbean is mostly just uh, just filled with uh, art. It's it's you you look at the uh, you look at the work, you enjoy the aesthetics of it. Um, yeah, they're creating a world. Uh, you know, it's it's you can look at a ride at Disneyland like Pirates of the Caribbean is a good example is like just a giant installation. That- <laughs> <laughs> which is, uh, you know, a form of art that they do at museums, right? Um, I think what you're, you know, the interesting division that I think you make, Chris, is that uh, you say that there is a stark division between uh, the art at a place like Disneyland and the art at a place like uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And the stark difference is you need some sort of uh, education or information to be able to enjoy the work at a museum, whereas... At Disneyland, you don't need to know anything. You can be completely ignorant because it, it because the art of Disneyland is intuitive. It hits you on a gut level. Uh, it's 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 based on human biology somewhat to a certain extent. Uh, and then the Metropolitan Museum of Art is totally different. It's like some sort of uh, intellectual only only people who have been educated in a certain way in a certain culture can enjoy that kind of art. You know, I don't know if this is true. Congratulations. I, mean, I waited as long as possible not to interrupt you, but no, that's not what I mean. Uh, not at all. Uh, in fact, art doesn't work. Fine art. I am the son of a fine artist. Art does not work for most human beings unless we can relate to it on a gut and visceral level. The key difference between uh, making a really interesting looking, scary Jack Sparrow and a Mark Rothko color line isn't the education, is not just that. It's literally how it rests upon you. Mark Rothko puts three lines of colors. Or William Blake, I'll be better, because William Blake depicts ocean sequences. Uh, sorry, did I say Blake? I meant, well, Blake or Turner, doesn't matter. Turner or Blake, they have an ocean sequence of British ships, just like Pirates of the Caribbean. But the difference is it's, your it hits you viscerally you see a ship you see it in the water you see it you're seeing it as a painting or you're seeing it as a sculpture or you're yeah you're really seeing it in a way that isn't trying to do more than just be what it is because the artist is trying to make it that way whereas commercial illustrative art is always in the service of something else it's like, this is what you think about when you look at the movie. This is what you think about when you think of the animation. It's not bad or good. And if you can't have a visceral experience in fine arts, then you are a very poor human being. Because long before there were universities, long before there were critics, there were always artists making art. It's well, just, I guess... Well, well, anyway, I'm sorry. That's what well, I'm I, to I just say. have You're a question. Going, you're going to feel something on a... The, I think the agreement when you go to Disneyland as a ticket buyer is you're going to be enthralled and excited. And I think the agreement when you're buying tickets to go to an art museum is you're agreeing to have at least one piece of work at that museum, touch your soul, touch your soul, hit you in a way that you can't explain, you don't understand, but on some very base non-intellectual level, 
this work speaks to you in a way that is so profound that it almost feels, I'm not going to use religion in the Judeo-Christian sense, but like religion, that is an element of the divine that you cannot, that you know is special and unique and like magic has been created by this one particular artist and not a legion of technicians working in a factory trying to make the perfect Jack Sparrow. You, you, well, you don't think uh, people, especially children, have that experience at like a Disney park? I actually don't know if children can distinguish between the aesthetic of beauty of going to an art museum and the aesthetic beauty of going to Disneyland. And maybe there's something really lovely and innocent about that. But as a mature adult who's lived in the world, you should be able to distinguish what makes Disneyland a very beautiful experience, even aesthetically, with its great detail. And it's great. It's quite lovely. I've literally taken photos of every lighting fixture in Disneyland. So I'm a total Disneyland imagering geek. But it's a different kind of beauty than the beauty that you will find in a fine art museum. It's a different kind of experience, not better, not worse. Just All right, different. I, I had a question for you. You said that uh, commercial art is is in the service of something else. Uh, what what is that something else? Whatever the thing it's trying to sell, whatever that is, whatever the story it's trying to sell, whatever is going to get you to like it, to be appealing. Really, in that sense, commercial art goes out of its way to be appealing, to draw you in for the sake of getting as many people to like and identify as possible. Whereas there is a bit of commentary, I think, in fine art, where it's really a much more personal statement about what the artist is trying to say or express about reality or what's in their mind or in their heart or poetry or whatever it is that is unique to them and what a critic can then pick up upon versus what you, the audience, can. And it, I do also believe there's crossover too. Like, for example, uh, Charles Dickens wrote these great books in magazines, you know, like A Tale of Two Cities came out, you know, in these periodicals, and they're designed literally so that you'll buy the next issue. He was a very successful commercial artist, but now today we consider Tale of Two Cities a great work of critical art. Uh, so it's not like just something, time sometimes will take something that's a commercially successful and decide that it's more resident than we think, that even though Dickens is writing to entertain, he's also writing to depict his feelings about socioeconomic disparity or relationships and parents and childhood. It's not so cut and dry. Does that make sense with Dickens? Do you like Dickens? Yes. I mean, well, you say it's not so cut and dried. I mean, I totally agree with that sentiment. Um... Or you look at like Death of a Salesman, right? Critically successful play. Uh but I feel like every high school in America, right? Good luck going through, again, high school in America or college in America without sitting through at least some production of Death of a Salesman. And most people like Death of a Salesman. Have you ever seen a production of Death of a Salesman? No, I haven't. Well, have you ever? Oh, go well, give it a shot. I think you'll like it. I mean, <laughs> it deals with things. It's on my list. Even, it's on my list. It's, well, it, 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 it's called a, an American Tragedy. And it deals with things that are very, you don't need to know a lot about a lot to get into the play. If you want to, you can, there's a lot going on subtextually in the production. There's a, I've studied it in college and in grad school, and there is so much going on in A Death of a Salesman, but none of it is necessary to enjoy what is a very basic human tragedy. Uh, look at uh, Citizen Kane. When it came out, it was a commercial failure. A bomb. Now, in fairness, it's possible it was not allowed to be a critical success because it was an indictment of William Randolph Hearst and critics weren't allowed to write anything good about it or Hearst because, A, he controlled a lot of the newspapers and what newspapers he did not control, he controlled movie theater so he would pull his ads out if they gave it a good review. But that was a movie that was a bomb when it came out in the 40s and it wasn't until the late 50s and the French... Uh, Cashew is du cinema. Did I say that right? I have no idea. <laughs> anyway, who these Frenchmen who said, oh, this is a work of genius. And now Citizen Kane is on the AFI's top. It's normally considered either in the top five films. Uh, again, if you ever take a film class in high school or college, 
you're going to run into Citizen Kane. I mean, you've you know, you know, Kane. another good example. Well, uh, another good example of uh, a commercial failure, but a critis- critical success is the top movie in the IMDb, which what? is uh, Shawshank Redemption. Right. Oh, when yeah. It came out. Everybody loved it. Everybody said all the critics loved it. It did. I don't think it got any Oscars for anything because like it, it was such a flop. And then uh, here it is years later, top of the IMDb and, and hasn't been unseated ever. <laughs> Right, and so everybody's shocked by it. Everybody's shocked by it. That's a that's another modern example of that. And just also, and I didn't know this. I did some research for the show. But you know, there was a book that came out that was written as an appeal to fine art. It was considered, you know, the author's intention was to try to say something meaningful about the church and Renaissance art, and really write something that was very deep and profound. Uh, and it got lambasted by the critics it even got lambasted <laughs> by solomon rushdie a man who wrote the satanic verses and philip pullman who wrote this whole anti uh, uh, anti-religious uh series called the uh, oh darn it you know what i'm talking about left behind no 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 the, the one who does uh the, the the children like this book um i don't know oh, man uh, anyway i apologize well anyway People who've written about God and religion didn't even like it. And that was the Da Vinci Code. Oh, His Dark Materials. That's what he wrote, His Dark Materials. Anyway, the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. It got nothing but just terrible, terrible, terrible reviews from book critics. Turns out to become a giant bestseller. Uh, I even remember they put out like a $50 annotated version of the Da Vinci Code, included with Chad Prince of all the artworks that uh that it uh it depicted everybody was reading the da vinci code remember that yeah the da vinci code was huge it was huge you could, and then the, then then ron howard made a movie out of it which also got by the way universally panned it has a 26 <laughs> percent by uh, uh rotten tomatoes score and that thing made 760 million dollars at the box office and spurred, uh, I think, two more Da Vinci Code films, just you know, they, like the books. That's a great example of something something that's kind of like uh, so outside of what we're talking about because the author is really trying to make something that, uh, that is supposed to be a criti- critical success, right? He's, yeah. He's, he's trying to make something high-minded he's and intellectual. Very much so. And, he's... Uh, something for the critics, and uh, it's the masses that like it instead. Exactly. <laughs> It's exactly like it, 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 and you know, I know that uh, it was the same idea behind a love story. Eric Siegel was a classics professor. He was just at Harvard. He was just trying to show that he could take the structure of a of Greek classic tragedy and adapt it into a, a work of art. And he thought this would be this great cerebral thing. It becomes a pop bestseller. You know, never planned to be a romance writer in his life. Uh, he's a professor of classics at Harvard. This is nothing he intended to do. So. Uh, it and backfire you, and I think, really, I think when you get down to it, I think that, uh, um, and, and I'm not, I, I don't like to be so damn America centric, but <laughs> in America, I think we really believe a lot in the meeting of the middle. I think that we try very hard to find middle ground, and I think that's why uh, so much of what you see in America is middle brow art, art that incorporates both critically acclaimed elements and mass appeal elements. And like what I'm thinking of here by example is say, uh, Catcher in the Rye. You've read Catcher in the Rye. Yes, I've read it. And it's again, you hit it in high school normally. Uh, But Catcher in the Rye is a book that people will read not just because they've been forced to read it. Often they'll read it before they read it in high school. They'll read it as a 13 year old because it's just a fun read, isn't it? Yeah, well, I read it in my 20s. So uh, yeah, I like it a lot. But on your own, right? Yes. No one forced you. And it's a fun read and it works on both levels. I think of the artwork of Andy Warhol, right? People love his art, both critics and people who just think it's cool looking. Uh, The Beatles, right? I mean, critics are always writing about the Beatles and all, and and rightfully so, musicology about what they did, the tonalities, all of that stuff. But also people love to listen to the Beatles and buy their albums. the 1995 film Forrest Gump, right? Critically acclaimed, commercially successful. You know, Steven Spielberg, I think, is really the answer to the whole Wes Anderson, uh, James Cameron divide because Steven Spielberg makes both action films and he also makes uh, 
critically acclaimed film. Do you know, in 1993, he released both the most uh, financially highest grossing film of that year and the most Oscar nominated film of that year. Schindler's List and Jurassic Park. I mean, what do you think of Steven Spielberg? Uh, you know, uh, Spielberg is interesting to me because he does seem to have a real sense of if something is going to be a uh, commercial work or a critically acclaimed work. I mean, he seems to know his audience really well. I mean, you know, he makes Schindler's List knowing that it's going to be critically acclaimed. He makes... Uh, uh, Jaws, knowing that it's going to be a blockbuster, he makes uh, he has some flops, but his flops, he 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 totally uh, he totally understands what direction he's going, what kind of audience he's trying to reach. Um, I mean, and I mean, Wes Anderson, you know, you watch a Wes Anderson movie, it's hard to know what Wes Anderson's thinking, <laughs> like who he thinks he's making this movie for. <laughs> but you know, that's. A lot of great works are like that. I mean, Catcher in the Rye, right. I think, is but, like that. You're definitely saying what I think with Spielberg is, is really worth pointing out. He will bring in a Tony Kirshner who wrote Angels in America, a critically acclaimed playwright. He will bring in Steve Zillian, who is a very commercially successful screenwriter who's written a number of hits. And he has a real good sense of how to make works that appeal to everybody. And he knows how to make works that are limited in their appeal. My favorite Steven Spielberg films, by the way, are all his commercial failures. I, I love AI. I love uh, Empire of the Sun. I think those are two of his best works. Uh, I don't love 1941, but I am fascinated by 1941. And I, I have to admit, you know, whenever Steven Spielberg, I even like Armstrong. I, I think whenever Spielberg makes a film that is is not even remotely commercially successful, even if that was his intention, but he fails. I think it's because there's a darkness. You know, he, a lot of his stories are about abandoned fa children looking for their fathers, especially AI and Empire of the Sun. And I think if he had never made a single critically successful film after a Close Encounters and he just made these dark personal films, I think we would just give him credit is being a really good critical filmmaker. And I think if he had never made any of those films, but just the blockbusters, he would have ended up being the Cameron of, of, of well, even better than Cameron, right? Because he pushes action films in a level that even Cameron can't touch. I mean, you look at Close Encounters, you look at Raiders, you look at Jaws. Those are some of the most significant action films ever made. You know, I, it, what comes to mind for me is Roger Corman, who who attempts to make a commercially successful movie with every movie he makes, <laughs> except for once. And uh, I forget the name of that movie. It's the, the William Shatner movie. Um, I've never seen any of his films. To me, he is neither critically acclaimed or commercially successful. <laughs> well, he claims to be commercially successful with every movie, except for, uh, I think it's The Intruder. Well, he's, he might have been profitable, but I don't think he's commercially successful. Which is a, a whole other thing we can talk about in a future episode but go on but anyway yeah so uh so corman makes this movie it's a social commentary movie it stars william shatner it takes place in the 60s it's about the civil rights movement um it makes an interesting uh it makes an interesting point about the uh the movement um and then uh the movie is a critical critical success okay it makes uh, Corman thought it would be a commercial success, but it was a critical success. Uh, it got a lot of great reviews, and then it totally flopped in the box office. <laughs> and then Corman yeah. said in interviews after that, after that experience, he just said, "Forget it. I'm never making another critical success. Every movie I'm going to make from now on is going to make money." The end. Well, that's so really movie, interesting because every movie never. I never realized that he made a critical success before. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, you should watch it. It's a good movie. Uh, but yeah, but after that. You know, all those movies are very genre. They're very. Uh, there's a lot of action. You know, <laughs> they're, they're 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 not the kind of movies that the critics are gonna like. So there you go. I mean, and certainly a lot of the people who worked under Corman would go on to become great critical successes. Ron Howard, uh, Martin Scorsese. Uh, there's a number of other people. I'm forgetting Jonathan Demme, John Sayles. In fact, weirdly enough, I will say this much uh, as a mentor 
of people who could make critically successful films or commercially successful films. His legacy is right up there with some of our finest film schools. Well, Corman, the thing about Corman is he's like Spielberg. He really understands the audience, you know, and he knows what the audience wants. And he tried to make a movie early on that uh, he wanted, <laughs> but, but the audience didn't want that. And that's it. I mean, it's it's an interesting quality that uh, that a lot of the most successful commercial artists have. And we already talked about Stephen King. I mean, you know, almost every Stephen King work, uh, I feel, whenever I watch it in movie form or read it, I mean, he he's really trying to hook you the audience he's trying to hook the mass audience trying to reel them in you know make a real cloud crowd pleaser as uh pt barnum might have said <laughs> and he knows what he's doing you know uh, you don't you don't get that sense with a lot of other uh, uh artists you know a lot of there's a there's a lot of artists who who uh uh they either don't care about the audience or they don't really have a sense of what the audience wants you know and so they're and i just want to be fires I want to be very clear about this. I don't think critical successful work is made to spite an audience. I don't think that's what you mean either. And I read King's memoir, and it's very clear that he works as hard as any other novelist to write the best quality of fiction he can write. It just happens. And, and this is interesting. I remember when I first started out as a playwright, I, I wrote a farce. It was very funny. It was, on, it was a night of three one-act plays. And mine was the first, it was uh, one of the three plays and the other two were dramas. And they were interesting. They were very well written dramas and some people liked them and some people didn't. And I wrote a very broad paced comedy where a man's pants come off and you see his colorful boxers. And it was, it was the mass appeal success. The others were more critical successes. And it is weird because I don't think it's very rare that I think an artist is deliberately going to write something that they think is going to be a commercial success or a critical success. And sometimes I think it just, it's wherever their voice hits, you know? I think as an artist, sometimes you're just gonna read a tribe of people who are more critical minded and you're gonna read a tribe of people who are more just entertainment minded. And I mean, that's the beauty of our show is a really here to try to cover both elements. Uh, Randall, if a genie could grant you one wish, <laughs> would you be a commercially successful artist or would you be a critically acclaimed artist? That's a good question, isn't it? Um, I think I would be a critically acclaimed artist just because it seems more interesting to me. You, you make think... more interesting work, more original work. Yeah. I'd be a commercially successful artist because I really want a much bigger pool and a much bigger house. Uh, and at, at the end of the day, <laughs> but you I don't, don't really have a care. pool. You I don't, don't really. I do have a pool. Oh yeah, I that's just, right. <laughs> I, I do. I just don't care what history will make of me. I just want to have a good life full of commercial goods. So that said, I'd like to know, hey, <laughs> listeners. First of all, this is a super long episode. What do you think? Like. Are you a cultural snob? Are you a populist? Uh, do you think uh, there's an argument being made for good art, bad art, critically acclaimed art, successful art? What did you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? I promise you this. Anybody who has any opinion who comments, we will read your letter unless you tell us not to. We will answer your question and we'll give it the attention it needs because at the end of the day, your input controls the kind of show we're doing and then without it, we're just going to make up more episodes like this. Until then, I'm Chris Corbell. <laughs> I'm Randall. Thanks for listening. Bye.